You know, um, at different times in our life, um, we often get an opportunity to give a word of advice or a little bit of instruction to somebody. Um, maybe it's your son or your daughter who is getting married and you can take them aside that you know, night before and just give them a little bit of wisdom that comes from your, um, from your um, life. Um, or maybe it's your um, one of your children going off to school, you know, they're five, and um, you've got to give them a little bit of instructions and advice. In the same way, um, there were events where Jesus actually gave us some instructions. And so one of them was when he was being raised up into heaven. Um, he went to the disciples and he actually you know, gave them some instructions. Um, so I'd like to just go to that Matthew um, verse 28, um, sorry, chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And then I love this bit, and lo, it's the way that my Bible was written, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Um, and that's pretty special to realize that Jesus is actually here today with us, right? He's actually here with us right through to the end of the age. Um, one of the um, areas of the Bible that I'm really, really interested in is, in essence, the seven messages that Jesus actually gave to the church in Revelation, right? He, um, it was interesting. What really, really took my attention was that I realized that chapter 2 <coughs> and chapter 3 of Revelation is Jesus' last instruction to the church, Right? You won't find the church is actually mentioned after chapter 3 until you get to chapter 19. And at that stage, we're actually coming back with Jesus in his second coming. So those messages to the churches um, in chapter 2 and chapter 3 are his last words to the church. And so I actually really believe there's um, messages not only to those churches, but there's actually a message to us in the 21st century. Right. So when I'm actually reading those messages to the church, I'm really looking for what are those things that we can apply for our lives today um, that come out of those messages. So we've already talked a little bit about um, Ephesus, um, first love, and then uh, last time I talked about the church, um, Smyrna, about um, just the peace of God. And today I want to actually talk about the third church, which is the Church of Pergamon. So before I actually go and actually look at the Scripture, what I want to do is just give you a little bit of context to per uh, Pergamon. I want to tell you a little bit about this place. Um, 2,000 years ago, around about AD 100, when Jesus was actually writing this message to the church. And the first thing I want, I really want you to probably take away two points about the actual church. The first of all is that it was a bureaucratic town. It was the ruling town of Asia Minor. It was the capital of Asia Minor. It was uh, the equivalent of Wellington, basically. It's where all the politicians were, all the rules and regulations came out of. Um, you know, it was one of those cities which basically controlled people, right? There was a real spirit of control actually going in the, in, in the town. The second thing is that they were known as being temple worshippers. So they really, really um, liked um, being really, really good temple keepers. You know, I talked a little bit about Smyrna being a good um, Caesar worshippers, or then Pergamon wanted to be really, really good worshippers of um, temples. And they had some really, really interesting temples there. Um, one of them was actually a hospital. It's where, interestingly, the curled snake um, and the staff actually came out of Pergamon. And it came out of one of the temples there where you could actually go and book in for the night, go into the catacombs, and then they let the snakes out. Sounds a very unpleasant place to me, right? And then one of the other temples that was there was actually the temple of Zeus, right? So Zeus was actually known as Satan's temple, right? It was his altar. So Satan, you know, Pergamon was basically his town, right? He was there. Um, one of the interesting things I actually found out was um, in the 1930s, um, German engineers actually went to Pergamon and they actually disassembled um, the altar of Zeus. 
And then they actually took that and they put it in Berlin in 1930. And you can actually go and see it. Not that I would ever want to go and see it, but it's actually in the Pergamon Museum, actually in Berlin. And then after that, obviously, came Hitler. So you've got to wonder how much influence that actually had. And then even like listening to Nick about the struggles that they're having in Western Europe around Christianity, right? So you just wonder where Satan is residing um, these days. So um, what I'd like to do is actually turn to um, the message to the church in Pergamon. Um, and so that's Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So there was a couple of things that were actually happening with, in Pergamon. One is that the teaching of Balaam is actually simply if you can't curse them, then corrupt them, right? So actually get inside the church as a wolf and actually mislead them. So that's basically the teaching of Balaam. And then the teaching of the Nicolaitans was it's nothing wrong with actually um, conformity to the world standards. Right. So whatever is actually happening in the world, that's actually okay. If, uh, if it's okay to have abortions, then that's actually okay, right? It's conformity to the actual world, right? So you've got to understand that this is, in a sense, what was actually happening to some of the members within the church um, in Pergamon. So my question is, what should we be doing in the 21st century to make sure that we actually don't compromise our faith? Right? What can we actually do to make sure that we you know, aren't doing the types of things that were, was actually happening in Pergamon? And the actual answer comes in the scriptures either side, actually, of um, the, the scriptures that I've shown. So I want to go in particular to Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things say he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Oh, yes. right? So the two-edged sword is the word of God. Amen. It is the word of God that enables us to stand about compromising our faith. It is what actually stops us compromising our faith. So whether it's the word of God actually spoken into your life um, through Christians beside you, or whether it is reading um, the word of life through the Bible, or whether it's through the Holy Spirit speaking into your life, Amen. it is actually the word of God, you know, the word of God that basically enables you to stand against compromise in your life. Um, what I'd like to do is just turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And I'll just get a glass of water. Hang on. Sorry about that. Um, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. What I would like to do is actually just talk a little bit about my testimony, a little bit of my journey um, for about seven years of my life. Um, it's seven years of my life where you could probably describe me as a backslidden Christian, um, as somebody who had actually been isolated from other Christians. Um, and in a sense, what had actually happened is the church that we went to um, was a little family church. It had actually decided to um, basically close down and become a church or house church movement. So we then went to, Vicky and I went to a little house church for about two years. And then after about two years, that actual church itself, actually, or that house church, also just fell away. So I found myself in a situation where I was actually not going to a church. And what's more, the actual people that were in that house church actually disappeared out of my life. Um, some of them actually went into the mission field, um, went over into Thailand, actually um, sowing rabbit churches, little house church movements in Thailand. Very, very successful missionaries that came out of that work. Um, still there now, 10 years later, actually working in the mission field. So it was, you know, God actually moved through that house church movement. 
Um, but others actually went down into the South Island. One of my closest friends, he went down to work in the South Island. And then the other people that were going to the house church, actually, they just disappeared. They just went into the fabric of normal day life. So all of a sudden, I found myself without a church, not going to a church, a little bit, um, I suppose, wounded also from the process of coming out of a church and also just having no actual Christians in my life, right, actually speaking into my life. The other thing that actually happened then is after 22 years of marriage, Vicky and I actually separated. So we actually spent seven years um, separated until God actually miraculously restored our marriage, right? And I just want to say at the moment that I have a huge amount of love for my wife. She is an awesome woman of God and an awesome wife, right? So just want to really, really just highlight that. But nevertheless, for about seven years, um, we were actually separated. So I was actually quite a lonely Christian, right? Um, No church, no Christians actually speaking into my life. But, big but, (laughs) I actually had the Word of God, right? I actually had one scripture in particular that I actually held on to. And that scripture was 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And you would have heard this. And now these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And that became the scripture that I literally hung my life on for about <coughs> seven years. Wow. Right? Um, I would wake up in the morning and I would pray that scripture. You know, God strengthen my faith, strengthen my love, strengthen my hope. I would go and I would, if I was reading the Bible, I'd pick on hope and I would go and study all the scriptures around about hope or I'd script, um, do all the scriptures around faith or all the scriptures around love, right? So the thing I'm trying to make is that I got a, a huge amount of emotional and spiritual encouragement through that scripture. God's word, right, was working in my life. He was giving me a huge amount of comfort um, in my life, both both spiritually and emotionally, through that actual word. The other thing that happened is that um, there was no Christians in my life, so God just spoke to me basically through the Holy Spirit. So he spoke his word into my life through the Holy Spirit. I can remember just after Vicky and I separated, going up the road for a bit of a walk and you know, having a bit of a natter to God, as you do. And God actually made me three promises. And uh, he's actually kept two of them. I'm still waiting for the third one. Um, after about 10 years, I believe it will come into fruition. But one of the, uh, the, the promises that he made me is that he would restore my marriage. So what I did is I just basically said to him, well, what do I do? Right? And he came back and he basically said, sit quietly and watch. So for the next several years, my life was consisting of sitting quietly and watching, basically. I felt a little bit like the, um, the kid in the back seat of the car, you know, when you're going away on holiday with mum and dad in the front seat. Are we there yet? <laughs> Have I got there yet? But in my case, it was actually, what am I watching for? Hey, Lord, you said I should sit quietly and watch. What am I watching for? Tell me what I'm watching for. And all I would get from the front seat was sit quietly and watch. (laughs) So um, the thing I really want to make, the point I want to make, is that God's word actually influenced my behavior, right? The joints and the marrow. It actually influenced what I did, and it influenced the intent of my heart, right, and what I thought, right? So God's word, even though there was no Christians, God's word was having an amazing influence actually over my life. Then um, there was one morning which God actually answered my question. He said, sit quietly and watch for true love. Do you know what true love is? True love is actually one of the names of Jesus, Jesus Christ. He is true love. And it was about two or three months after that that he actually restored our marriage, right? And that promise came true, right? So, um, you know, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
The other thing I just wanted to share a little bit was just about the fact that God's word is profitable, right? So if you want to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy um, chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, the thing to remember is that this, um, this book of Paul is actually his last letter to Timothy um, that we're aware of. Right, He was actually in prison at this stage, um, chained probably to the wall, very aware that he was going to be executed to his faith for his faith and obviously he was writing the letter um, to Timothy which is really his his son in the faith right one of his key disciples and I think the first thing is that the scripture is actually given by the inspiration of God right that's where its power comes from that's where its life comes from it comes from God so um, you know it's just not words that are written on a page right God's word actually has power actually has life in it. Then it talks about being profitable for doctrine. The word profitable actually means helpful or advantageous. And the word doctrine actually means belief, right? And if you follow through belief, it's acceptance that something is true. So what it's actually saying here is God's word is true, right? You can trust it. It's faithful, right? You can actually trust his word. His word is solid. Right? And then he goes on and he actually talks about, in a sense, how you use the word in your life for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. It's basically the manual. right? It's the manual for life. It tells you what you shouldn't do, tells you what you should be doing. And if you're doing something wrong, it'll also tell you how you actually correct it. Yeah. Right? So I know that the guys in, in here today and the guys that might be watching this message don't necessarily always go to the manual. It tends to be the last thing that we go to. But actually, I really, really encourage you to actually read you know, the actual manual for life. Um, we've actually got three of these, three Bibles sitting on our coffee table at home. The oldest one was printed in 1864. Wow. Right? It's, a, it's a beautiful old Bible handed down to Vicky. Right? And it's got even got the, you know, the buckles on it that hold it more or less together. The interesting thing is when you read it, it's exactly the same as this one. The manual hasn't changed. Right? It's the only manual that I'm aware of that hasn't changed. It's actually the same now as it was 500 years ago in reality. So um, I wanted to just finish off basically talking a little bit just um, when I was a child and just about how as you get closer to the word of God, God actually gets closer to you. So um, I actually first heard about Jesus when I was seven in a Bibles in school class. I um, I come from a family that is not a Christian family. My uh, mum and dad never took me to church, never actually heard Jesus spoken of in the house, never heard God mentioned it in the house. But in a Bibles in school class, somebody gave me the Gospel of Luke. And I took that little brochure, that little booklet home, and I would sit in my bedroom and I would read it. Wow. And I actually held that little booklet right through till I was a teenager. Right? And even though I wasn't in a Christian home, that Word of God actually had an influence over my life yes. as a child, as a um, teenager, and as a young adult. I actually then got saved when I was 37. I made a commitment. I received God into my heart, got baptized. And as I found I got closer to God, right, He got closer to me. And as I've gone through my life, as, uh, as I get a little bit older and a little bit more wiser, as I find I get closer to God, he gets closer to me, right? So, um, yeah, I just really, really encourage you to, to, you know, get the word of God into your life. It's a real key thing. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. Can I um, 
Just get everybody to stand, please.